Thank you for joining us to discuss the role of digital public inf infrastructure or DPI in the global development context. My name is Noam Unger, and I am the director of the Sustainable Development and Resilience Initiative here at CSIS and a senior fellow with the Project on Prosperity and Development. This virtual discussion is the first in a series of planned CSIS events intended to unpack the concept and importance of digital public infrastructure in enabling digital services and promoting innovation. DPI has underpinned the world's digital transformation and various forms of DPI are prevalent across sectors and countries. While primarily associated with digital services, earlier digital public infrastructure yielded the internet and GPS. Today, we can think of DPI as the foundation and enabler of digital services provided to citizens. By providing a robust framework for digital services, good DPI enables governments to efficiently deliver to their citizens while ensuring security, privacy, and accessibility. Today's discussion is not meant to specifically pin down a singular definition of digital public infrastructure, but rather to discuss the importance, opportunities, and challenges of DPI. That said, it could be helpful as I kick off this discussion to share the wording from the outcome document of the G20 Digital Economy Minister's Track that described DPI as, and here I'm quoting, a set of shared digital systems that should be secure and interoperable and can be built on open standards and specifications to deliver and provide equitable access to public and or private services at societal scale and are governed by applicable legal frameworks and enabling rules to drive development inclusion, innovation, trust, and competition, and respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, unquote. They then referred to it as an evolving concept and acknowledged that there are differing uh, terminologies and country contexts. Essentially, my sense is that we are talking about large or population scale digital systems for better public service delivery. And today we're talking about it in connection to global development. With next week's SDG Summit rapidly approaching, it is also certainly worth noting that DPI is relevant across so many components of the Sustainable Development Goals. As we work toward reducing inequality through digital inclusion and toward accelerated progress against global goals in the face of significant setbacks, building out digital infrastructure that is strong, transparent, and resilient is a priority. We are fortunate to host five experts here with us today to discuss these issues. Each brings a unique perspective. Robert Opp is the, digital, the Chief Digital Officer at the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Prior to that, he worked for more than a decade with the World Food Program in various operational and leadership roles, including as Director for Innovation and Change Management. And he previously worked with Boston Consulting Group as well. Priya Vora is the CEO of the Digital Impact Alliance, a leader in advancing financial inclusion and digital development she previously founded Future State, helped build the financial inclusion practice at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and also served at USAID in the Obama administration, which is where you and I first met, Priya. Uh, and that was uh, when she established the agency's digital development team. Anit Mukherjee is a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation America, where he leads the program on global economics and development policy and focuses on governance of the emerging digital economy. He was previously a policy fellow with the Center for Global Development and an associate professor with the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Grace Coe is vice president for government affairs or government relations at Siena Corporation. She was previously Nokia's head of government affairs for North America. She also served as special assistant to the president for technology, telecom, and cybersecurity policy and has worked for several private sector law firms on Capitol, and on Capitol Hill with the subcommittee uh, in the House on Communications and Technology. And David Eaves is a member of the Investment Committee of CoDevelop, a nonprofit fund focused on digital public infrastructure. David is an associate professor in digital government at the Institute for Innovation and Public Policy at University College London. He also previously served as co-founder and CEO of ReCollect. I am momentarily going to turn to each of them in that order that I just briefly introduced them so that they can provide some opening comments and tell us a bit more about themselves, how their organization is approaching DPI and why digital public infrastructure is important for international development. Then we'll get into some further questions and some back and forth. But before we start all that, I do wanna to mention to all of our live viewers and listeners today that if at any point you have a brief question for our panelists, please go ahead and enter it. 
by clicking on the button that says Ask Questions. And that can be found on this event's webpage or in the YouTube description section as well. We will do our best to work those into the discussion as it progresses. All right, with that, let me hand the microphone over. Rob, welcome. Please tell us a bit more about yourself, how UNDP is approaching digital public infrastructure and why DPI is so important for development. Well, thanks so much, Noam, and it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm not sure how I landed the honor of being the first to speak, uh, especially on this panel, but it's really, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think, you know, on this subject of digital public infrastructure, this is something that UNDP has really been working to embrace and integrate into our programs. And I think, you know, we see that there's several opportunities here, um, you know, and I think it's important to recognize, as you did in your intro, that some of these things that we're talking about here are not really new. I mean, ICT for development has been around for at least a couple of decades, and there's all these sort of different pieces that have been done. But what is new is that there is a realization that in approaching this in a particular way, we can achieve more coherence. Um, and so, you know, there's sort of three things that I would say um, that, that's important for international development when it comes to DPI. Um, and one is that really it allows for a connected or more coherent ecosystems thinking that, that joins sectors. So what we have seen is that different sectors are approaching and embracing digital technologies in all sorts of different ways, but inevitably they tend to converge at certain points. And it makes sense to think of it in more of a, a kind of a, a cross-cutting and a sort of interoperability kind of focused way. And so the health sector and the education sector and the agriculture sector, they're all thinking about, you know, how do we link things to national registries? How do we make sure we have databases that exchange information with, you, with each other? And DPI really offers that. Um, it's also an approach that really has people embedded at the center. And this is where I would make a distinction that you made um, as well, which is sort of when we think about what's good digital public infrastructure for us, What's good, what makes digital public infrastructure particularly good and powerful is when people and their rights are really placed at the center. So it becomes a reinforcing technical layer that's guided by the right governance layers and puts people first. Um, and if it doesn't do that, we are not convinced that it will lead to human development, which is what we're all about and why we're interested in this. So really it's important uh, that that's at the heart of what we're talking about in this sort of digital public infrastructure concept. And then the last thing is really that um, it, it, we do think that it's, this offers an opportunity to accelerate the SDG uh, uh, achievement as well. So um, as you mentioned, you know, SDGs are way off track, partly thanks to the COVID pandemic, but also because of other challenges. When we look to where the acceleration is going to come from and where countries are, particularly LDCs, um, and, and some of the countries that are really, let's say, farther behind in their digital journeys, we can see what is able to be achieved. And so we look at, uh, for example, India, which estimates that they've received a 1.1% boost on GDP because of digital public infrastructure. Estonia estimates around 2%. We've done some work recently with Dahlberg that talks about how we think LDCs, least developed countries, could accelerate their GDPs by 20 to 30%. Uh, a five to 10 year acceleration on, on climate mitigation work, for example. So we've kind of, we're starting to see where some of these benefits can really um, come out. And UNDP is very keen to propagate the sort of good practice around DPI with people at the center. So we've really integrated this into our thinking when we work with countries worldwide. Uh, you know, we're engaged with over 125 countries on digital programming, 50 of them on national digital transformation. And so DPI is part of our thinking around that. And of course, this year, you mentioned the G20 work. We've been supporting the G20 as a knowledge partner as well. So I'll, I'll leave it there. But, um, you know, I think we are really excited about the opportunity that DPI presents here. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate those uh, opening remarks. And let me turn uh, the floor over to Priya. Thanks, Noam. Great to see you and great to be on this panel. Thanks for having me. 
You know, as I think about DPI, I think it's useful to contextualize it in terms of where we are with digital trends. And at Digital Impact Alliance, we're an alliance of some of the largest funders and players in digital development. You know, we're sponsored by the governments of uh, the United States, the UK, Germany, CETA, but also philanthropies like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Hewlett Foundation. Our goal is to really drive a conversation, do research and really uh, showcase ideas and strategies for making sure, as Rob says, people are at the center of the digital future. And I think as we look at some trends, it's, um, it's useful to kind of think about things pre-pandemic and where we are now. Um, you know, in some ways there are some real bright spots. There are now 2 billion more people online today than there were just before the pandemic. I mean, it's a remarkable statistic that we've got 2 billion more people on in just the last five years. So you're seeing a lot of the physical connectivity um, materialize. I know there's lots of uh, reasons to be concerned that that's not uh, true universally. There are pockets of, um, of inequities that are really persistent. But I mean, in terms of getting more people online, I think the trajectory is very, very positive. But simultaneously, what we're seeing are other concerns, the kind of the nature of the issues is changing. So we're seeing real issues around competition and monopolies really emerging. The, in Africa, four out of the five largest e-commerce com companies from five years ago are still in the top five today. And you see this worldwide where you know, the large firms just become even more dominant a lot of times because they're able to use their uh, dominance in, in underwriting new businesses and using data to better kind of crowd out uh, competitors and a lot of other things. So you're seeing issues of competition. You're seeing lots of issues of trust people concerned about how is my data being used or concerned about misinformation, disinformation. So in, as people are getting online, you're seeing simultaneously new concerns as they do. And I think DPI comes in the picture at this point because it's really trying to be a response to uh, trying to unlock innovation, more healthy competitive markets. Um, it's trying to create systems of trust and shared value out of data. And as Rob says, give more agency to people and understanding where their data is going and having ownership over their credentials. You know, here are my health records or here is my driver's license and really be able to utilize that with ease. Um, so I think DPI isn't new, a new concept, but I think it's a timely one responding to some of these larger concerns. And I'm looking forward to the discussion because as promising as the idea of DPI is, there are real challenges and, um, and they're multifaceted. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Priya. Anid, let me bring you into the conversation, please. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you for having me, Noam. And it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be with uh, four other panelists who are really leaders in this field. And I've known some of you for many years. Um, first of all, I think this is a really timely conversation. And the timeliness comes from two things. One is, of course, this whole propagation of the idea of DPI. And um, at ORF America, where I work, uh, we have been following and engaging with the G20 process. And it has been really interesting to see how that idea of a digital public infrastructure coalesced and was drafted and put in a leader's declaration. I think that just let's take a moment to say that that is pretty significant. The second is the upcoming SDG summit. And I think having put that idea, and as Rob said, that this is about people and SDGs is about people. SDGs is about moving the needle, not just one second at a time, but maybe one hour at a time right now. I mean, we are in the midpoint and we need to achieve uh, those goals pretty quickly. So I think the that it is time to move from just understanding or ideating about DPI to what it can do on the ground in actual uh, countries and how do we help or how can we manage this uh, this transition? I think that is different between digitalization as we have been 
you know, talking about, to creating digital public infrastructure. So I think that's my first point, that this is a paradigm shift in the idea of using digital technologies for development. And I, uh, my co-author Shankar Marwada and I wrote a paper two years ago at CGD saying that we need to basically move from what works, what works, the scale what works locally to build what works at, at population scale. So instead of looking at scaling up something that is working locally, build what is what should be working at population scale and we'll make mistakes and that's fine. I mean, it, but the paradigm has to shift. And that is where I would come and touch a little bit about our India experience. It's amazing. Yesterday, I was talking to somebody who is now in DC, whom I worked in the first team of Aadhaar in 2009. And here we are in 2023, 14 years, and suddenly DPI is in the global agenda. The second point is that if you look at the SDG goals, and I wrote a, uh, published a paper last week on this, DPI has differentiated impact on particular goals. For example, goal one on poverty, on social protection, on inequality, on gender, there are significant impact of having a DPI approach to these goals. And again, employment and, and, and others. The others, for example, life below ocean, you might think that, well, this is not where the DPI agenda fits in. But what I would submit to you, and this we can talk about later, is that from if you create a public infrastructure, which is digital, and public infrastructure has spillovers, and that is where you capture the spillovers from one sector to the other, as Robert and, and Priya were, were mentioning. So having that idea that if you build something for a particular sector that can have spillovers and be aware of those spillovers and be able to capture those spillovers and be able to um, uh, augment those. And the third, I would say, is that at ORF America, we are very uh, positive about using DPI and having the global South as a voice and how we, and as a, as a community, try to engage with this DPI conversation and use those uh, pr principles for creating our own, in some ways, the sovereignty, digital sovereignty issue that countries uh, should be concerned about. And we have two demonstration projects now going on, one in Brazil and the other in the Gambia, where we are trying to build DPI from, uh, from scratch in some ways, but very different capacities. But I can talk more about that. Just on closing, I think at this point, we need to more or less the definitional issues have been settled. Uh, there are issues, and as Priya said, on, on privacy and all that. Now let's talk about how we can implement that and get more use cases. Until such time, we will not have until such time, we will not have learnings. And that is what the lesson from India is, build and then learn and then you know customize. I'll stop there for the time being, but happy to, to come back later for questions. Thank you so much, Anit, really appreciate it. Grace, I'm gonna to turn to you. How does, does this paradigm shift look from your perspective? Yeah, um, this is a fascinating conversation. I'm really glad that um, CSIS and, and the Gates Foundation of Societies engage in this. Just to reintroduce myself a bit, um, Grace Coe, uh, I'm five and a half weeks into the job as Vice President for Government Relations at Siena. Siena is a global leader in optics design and development for equipment supporting transport networks, um, like these uh, large undersea cables. Um, uh, think of the Two Africa project being constructed today. Um, Siena also provides routing switching and software platforms for uh, network load um, management, prediction of network problems, addressing network activity. So if you think about it, um, just about everyone in the world transmits or receives data that is touched a piece of CN equipment. Uh, myself, I've worked in the tech and telecom policy world uh, in the United States for about 20 years. And I'm a firm believer that governments need to engage in building digital public infrastructure. And I kind of want to be a little uh, specific or precise about what I mean by DPI. I'm thinking specifically in the case of where the government needs the citizen. Um, uh, just uh, to start there. And I, you know, quite honestly, um, the, the remarks that um, uh, Priya Vora was making actually could resonate not just in developing countries, but actually here in the United States. You don't really have to go far to make the case for digital public infrastructure. Um, 
Uh, you can look at the United States and Florida in 2020, for example, where you had hundreds of people lining up to get paper applications for employment benefits because the website crashed. Um, there were others lining up at libraries to get access to public computers to get to the agencies that had web websites. So that problem is not just a developing um, a, a developing nation's problem. It is very much a problem that's here in the United States as well. And digitizing these functions that the government that governments can offer um, the citizenry um, can actually and they are so critical, particularly during a pandemic. But actually, this is this is a um, this is a question of utilization that allows for I think um, educating the um, uh, uh, educating the citizenry on how to participate better in society. Um, if you digitize these functions, citizens will be able to uh, will be. Uh, Governments can lower the uh, the barriers to entry for economic and social participation in society. It does allow for government to collect a lot of data, though, um, and that data can be an opportunity and it also can be an extraordinary risk. What we need to be able to do is to share this data safely with insight guidelines and to generate because this data can generate initiatives that address societal problems and can accelerate societal goals. Um, and when you do have that sort of secure, safe guideline um uh, a truly um uh truly well um well governed uh, uh management of data it also assists in transfer transparency of action you know when the government has done something as a citizen and citizens know that their responses have been recorded that is incredibly important to the functioning of a good functional society and those interactions can be made very public very quickly but obviously, as, as I've been hinting at, and I certainly think that my uh, my uh, my panelists have also said, my co-panelists have also said uh, in one respect or another, the precursors to establishing sustainable DPI are data governance, good data governance, um, strong cybersecurity, ubiquitous broadband access. Of course, there are other needs as well, but those are the three I'm going to point out. But you know, other needs include things like digital literacy within the citizenry, needs assessments, continued growth of the workforce, and you know, just one more point, because I think I'm the only person speaking from the private sector. Um, DPI can be a very healthy, meaningful indicator of the investment environment from for the for private um, for private companies seeking to invest in developing nations, which uh, I think is 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 a goal uh, for um, for changing uh, the environment for developing uh, nations. But how do you, as a as a Siena, um or, or another uh, company involved in investing in infrastructure. How do you, there is a catch 22. How do you invest in a country that badly needs good digital in, uh, public infrastructure, but um, doesn't have it at the moment? Uh, what, your risks are very high when you enter. That is for, um, for a company like Siena where governments can step in, other governments can step in and create, I think other guardrails de-risk the ability for these companies to go in and to partner with governments in order to be able to help build that, that initial infrastructure that will ultimately lay the groundwork for making it easier for other companies to, uh, to invest as well. And thank you, Anoam, for um, allowing me to have a, a minute. No, thank you, Grace. Um, and, and thanks for bringing your background and especially the, the that private sector investing perspective into the conversation and the need for timely de-risking as well. Let me turn over to David, last but not least. Uh, please uh, tell us your thoughts. Yeah, I think actually this panel reflects some of the challenges that we have in this space. Uh, I mean, candidly, I, I would actually be, I'm a little in the worry that someone who's arriving at this panel who's never heard of DPI before has not now arrived at this stage in the panel and has actually much of a clearer sense about what DPI is, um, because I think there's, there's, like in some ways it's kind of like, well, it's gonna do all these things for everyone everywhere. And as a result, like what, what actually is it? And I'm not sure that we've necessarily resolved that or that it's reflected in our comments so that someone who's newly arriving would know where to ground themselves in this conversation. And I think that actually comes back to kind of a deeper issue, which I think there's actually two competing notions about what's going on, neither of which is wrong, but that's actually at the core of this debate. So one is there's this notion of DPI as a set, like kind of an architecture choice. So if you're kind of like from a, a developer perspective, DPI is like, no, what are the kind of fundamental building blocks that one could use to repurpose, to kind of build almost any service or piece of, uh, piece of an activity that one would want to do in the world that kind of touches the digital realm. And that's kind of an architecture view of, of infrastructure. 
And then the other is kind of more of a, maybe a policy or a government view, which is if we're in a digital era now, there's a certain set of things that you need to possess as a sovereign entity in order to function in that era that didn't was simply not true 50 years ago and has become increasingly true in the last 50 years. So in a, in a pre-digital era, you as a government had an identity system. You had to be able to identify who your citizens were so that they could identify themselves both for public transactions and private transactions. You need to have some form of basis for monetary exchange so you could run an economy. And you wanted to have some safe and secure way for people to exchange some pieces of data supported by a legal system so that contracts could be enforced. And what I think digital, like, so for, for me, like there's an architecture view of like, oh, there's these fundamental points, but I think there's a different view, which is one is like, what is the modern infrastructure that one needs to run a state in a digital era? And I think there's a politically contested notion about what those range of things are, and not all countries agree. And that that like that set of things may vary from place to place. But I think at its very minimum core, like the one place where everybody would agree, like every state would be like, yeah, we need that, is you need to have some form of identification system. You want some autonomous way to ensure transactions in your country so that you know your economy can't be shut down by a third actor. And you want some sort of way to issue credentials and enable like e-signatures or some way to execute contracts in a way to secure. And I think the the bigger piece here is you're not getting out of the 21st century without those three things being in place. And so the only question in front of us now is are those things gonna be provisioned entirely by the private sector, possibly by companies that don't exist inside your borders? Or are they gonna be provisioned by a government at which point the kind of the concerns that Robert is raising around governance become hugely important because are we enabling a surveillance state or are we going to imagine some new form of governance, which is, I think, one of the things that like, at the core that we're wrestling with, that enables trust and safety in these systems that are essential to run not just a government, but also an economy, but also a civil and private sector. And so I think for me, like that's where I like to try to root the conversation is like it's a it's a debate over what this new infrastructure looks like and what the governance is going to look over it. But that doesn't preclude that you might have an architecture view, which is like there's all these various components we can recombine, but you could do those for any number of purposes, some of which I'm not quite as convinced are kind of public in their interest and orientation. So I, I hope for someone who's kind of arriving here new, this is kind of a, a helpful framing to kind of try to understand what's at the core of this conversation. Very much so, David. That was a great way to round out the, the, the opening uh, set of remarks uh, and a good challenge uh, to the overall topic set. I want to bring back in, given the points that you just made, something that Anit said, which is that we need to move from, from an idea uh, to how it can help on the ground in countries and connect it back to something that Rob also said at the start, which he was talking about India and Estonia and boosts to their GDP attributable to digital public infrastructure. So what are some of the actual practical case examples so far allowing, I need your point that there aren't enough and we need to build and, and learn from more. But even so far, what are some examples uh, of best case scenarios where countries have actually built up digital public infrastructure and how have they wrestled with some of these safeguarding challenges uh, that, that Priya and Grace and others have raised in the conversation? And let me just see who wants to jump in on that actually, uh, that, that question. I can take a shot. Um, so I, David, thank you for that. I think it was it was really well articulated. Um, to the point about how, what are the, the actual examples of digital public infrastructure? I think we are having, we're, we're getting a set of use cases for digital ID systems. And thanks to the work of the World Bank and 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 others, OMDR and many others, and again, as David said, that's a basic foundational layer. It's a it's a digital ID system. So you build your infrastructure on that. It's like one of the building blocks. Now, I think the basic idea coming out is that the governance. It's not the technology, but the governance of ID systems. That's a challenge, and it is definitely has to do with sovereignty. This definitely has to do with 
citizens concerns over surveillance and things like that right and i think the there there have been attempts in morocco and in philippines in bangladesh where the digital id systems have been created and are working uh, as a foundational layer on an implementation layer um, i would say that you know the oft repeated example is the upi unified payments interface right but the unified payments interface is a network layer that runs on the the data exchange so it is it is actually a protocol uh, that that manages the trans transformation the sorry the transfer and like india brazil i was there recently pix they have they've created their own kind of layer payment layer which is again pretty much interoperable a little bit different from from india's but the adoption of both upi and pix in these two countries have been stunning absolutely you know brazil very rarely do people now use cash anymore and uh, it used to be a card based and it's moved to much more of digital payment but i think the third and this is where i think we are struggling to to actually make dpi the building blocks and the application layer and again taking an architectural view but bringing in the regulation of how the next set of sectors would be coming on board for example e-commerce and there i we uh, like the, the 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 work that we are doing in the gambia is very instructive because there is already there are no big platforms but there is already a set of small players who are in the e-commerce space but they are again disparate and there's no kind of you know they they they're not coalescing into making a market because it is a 1 million people market right now how can a pro moving from a platform thinking to a protocol thinking can actually expand that market from having small groups of consumers into uh, a national market and this is what we are we are trying to see it is hard because the platform thinking has been so embedded in our concept of digital infrastructure that moving to something which is like a protocol which we use beckin as a public good is very hard for even policy makers first of all the the private sector and then the policy makers to grasp so i think i i try to answer your question as to giving you a few examples of countries that are doing it but again as i said i mean the use cases are still very very few and and we tend to revert back to india as our default like we used to do with estonia in terms of you know x road and all that but i think we need we need far more a uh, variety of 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 experiences uh, across the world to be able to conceptualize what what uh, david and priya and others have been saying Thank you. I'm in here a little bit. Yeah, please, and then and then Rob. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to digest, David, your your kind of opposing viewpoints, and I can't decide if I agree or don't agree because I I guess I think um, they can be uh, you know a policy choice to say we need digital public infrastructure can then lead to architectural choices. And I think that's what's so interesting about this whole world is, you know, you can have your values and principles way up here, but it's really how it then shows up in your code, you know, because the technology enables some of those values or undermines some of those values or principles. Um, and because, you know, it, we're not like living in a static world. Let me just give an example of Mauritius. You know, we talk about Estonia all the time and India all the time, but let's just talk about some, you know, some a place that we don't talk about. So Mauritius. Mauritius has um, invested, you know, years ago in uh, what's a data sharing architecture within their government. And basically, as Grace says, if you want to make sure your government to citizen interactions are seamless, you need to have a lot of this infrastructure that enables, um, you know, government ministries to access different data bases about you. So I'm Priya and I live here and, you know, I pay these taxes and whatever. So that that kind of layer of data exchange is really useful for government to citizen services. And Mauritius invested in its own uh uh, platform. They didn't use the, they explicitly did not use the version that uh, Estonia uses for a variety of reasons. Um, and 
They then simultaneously set up an institution, which is their data protection authority that said, if the government is having access to all this information, it's more free flowing within government, we're going to create this institution that oversees the use of that data. Not only does that data protection authority have kind of real staff and budget, but it has criminal ability to um, impose criminal sanctions against misuse of data. So if you are you know, a firm or a government official misusing that data, they can um, not only impose fines, but actual criminal penalties against you. So it's a very solid approach to data sharing. On the other hand, you know, it was designed with kind of a government lens in mind. This is about making government's life more easy. It had nothing to do with giving citizens transparency over how their data had flowed, had nothing to do with equipping people with their own credentials and allowing them to, you know, use their information and their data in kind of whatever ways that they were would be empowered to do. It didn't wasn't designed for the private sector to make use of that data outside of some financial use cases. So, you know, it's a it's a starting point and it is also an evolution. And I guess I would just say to David that I, I think you want to harness, um, you know, the kind of energy and the spirit of like, yes, let's make government more efficient, but do so in a way that really empowers people that really thinks about the startup community that thinks about the kind of institutional oversight and, uh, and, you know, not all, but some of it really does have to do with your architectural choices to make some of those um, ambitions a reality. Am I, uh, <laughs> am, am I confusing the point, David, or? Uh, let's let Robert go first and then I okay. don't have to chime in after. Great. So we'll, we'll turn to, to Robert and then and then come back to David. And I just want to remind folks who are tuned into the live stream uh, that if you do have questions, you can click on Ask Questions uh, and we can work some of those in if possible. Rob, over to you. Yeah, well, so I kind of agree with David and I agree with Priya as well, as if, if that's possible. But no, but picking up on where Priya left off, I mean, um, I think the comment I would make is that, yes, okay, we've got some of these kind of, and to your original uh, question, Noam, uh, we've got some of these sort of bright spots in India, Estonia, et cetera. Uh, Brazil's PICS has been mentioned. We can look at Singapore as a small island state. Um, and then we start to look at other instances where a, a kind of DPI or digital public infrastructure-like approach has had impact, but maybe there's not a full stack, if we can put it that way, um, available. And we've just worked as with, with the, the Indian presidency of the G20 on a compendium of these kinds of examples. We've got about 50 examples uh, that are kind of across the SDGs. And the, uh, the idea of that was to kind of map the, these sort of interesting examples that are not, let's say, full stack implementations necessarily, but that sort of point at ways that governments have done this to solve their problems in particular uh, kinds of approaches, but that we think probably could be uh, used for inspiration, could be augmented with other parts of the stack that, that kind of those more fundamental parts that uh, some of which David mentioned. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've got examples in there like um, Togo's Novisi program implemented after the, the COVID pandemic, you know, kind of quick social protection payments on mobile money that didn't exist before, but quickly put into place. Um, and then a more like kind of, uh, you know, more mature examples, Bangladesh has been building out its whole stack for uh, quite some time. Um, I don't know if those fingers are supported, David, or if those, <laughs> but, um, and, you know, uh, Bangladesh using like OpenCRVS, uh, an open source platform for their national um, civil registry and things like that. Um, and, and there's others out there. And so I do think, though, that the way that countries will adopt this will depend a lot on their particular context. That's probably a bit trite to say. But to Priya's point at the very beginning of this uh, session, talking about trust, it is a huge issue about what your system needs to look like will depend a lot on the, the level of trust between your government and your citizenry. Um, and so, you know, Estonia can do things in a different way. It's a smaller country, smaller context, high level of trust than some other countries may be able to do. Um, and so, you know, I think what we need to look for are the ways that we can 
embed people at the center of this approach, just to come back to that theme, I think that can be encouraged to be embedded in the technology, privacy by design, which is some kind sometimes talked about in Adhar and other systems, but then ensuring that the, the lessons around governance and how this needs to be a kind of minimum floor of governance that should be in, in place to ensure that these systems are including everyone uh, is what we really need to kind of work on to augment these sort of more, more technical approaches that have grown up over time. Thanks, Rob. And and while Rob was talking, David, I noticed that you were giving hand twinkles, uh, as he mentioned, examples from, from Togo and Bangladesh. And I gather that those were signs of support for, for those uh, those efforts. Let me turn it back over to you. Yeah, having run a virtual organization for a decade, you have ticks. So a lot of Zoom, like, hand twinkles just mean I agree. And often I say, as coming to you, my, my thinking phase sometimes gets construed as a negative view of our disagreement. But actually, no, it's, it's I have my thinking phase because I'm enjoying the panel so much, really causing me to kind of reflect and think. Um, but I know that sometimes when I'm thinking, I look serious and then makes people think I disagree or in some way. Um, I can't, maybe I want to go back, to, no, just continue to be like difficult. I want to go back and um, and kind of actually disagree with the kind of fundamental premise of the question, or at least unpack it um, to kind of to kind of convey to the audience where I think the question is right and where it gets misinterpreted. So I see this, like, I see the kind of conversation about digital public infrastructure as part of a much longer, con like much longer conversation. So one could hypothetically talk about analog public infrastructure. So like when you say like, show me where digital public infrastructure has been, in, been, been impactful, I would be like, well, like identity has been massively impactful. Like we only have um, the ability to offer people benefits and services, whether private or public sector, because of identity, like the my driver's license is used for me to enter bars, even at my healthy age when I'm in the United States, apparently I need to show it. And so like, there's like, and so it's used by the private sector and like, and it was a, it, in some ways it's a deeply interoperable system and in that it gets to be used by all sorts of people to validate who I am and has a, and has created an enormous amount of opportunity. But in a digital era that we, we now bounce up against the or, or bump up against the limits of that interoperability. And so what we're really trying to think about here is what are the kind of core systems that we think we need to have in order to run a society that can be refactored to be to create maximum opportunities and maximum extensibility and mass, maximum interoperability for unimagined for current and unimagined future states. And what we do know is those future states are definitely digital. So like I was kind of laughing earlier, the previous example, like I read there was a great story the other day about someone like somebody wanted to enable chat in Roblox and they had to like literally get on a call with someone and show their passport next to their face so they could be identified that they were they. And so then Roblox could have confidence that they weren't like, you know, going to go and talk to people who are inappropriate. And it's like, like, like this is a ridiculous way of solving this problem because we don't have an infrastructure that's extensible into the kind of private sector to allow them to authenticate who someone who someone is from a trusted authority. So so for me, like the demonstration of payments and data exchange and and identity are like those are proven for several hundred years now as being deep and sometimes in the case thousands are being deeply useful. The question now is what is the digital examples of those? And so even here in the United States, we have like. Like ACH is like a is a step on the movement from a purely analog payment system to a digital like a, a very extensible system. It just ACH, which is the way like your checks all get cleared when you write a paper check, is like it only clears once a day at five o'clock. But it's clearing in a digital way. It's just a very very narrowly extensible version that we need to make part of a journey. Like which Fed now is the next step, and hopefully something more aggressive will happen in the future on our way there. But I think actually the value is actually demonstrated. The bigger challenge is, is what is the cost of, unwrap, uh, of unraveling the invested capital that exists in some societies like the United States, where you've invested billions and sometimes trillions of dollars, not just in the, the, the IT, but in the trust and safety and the legal system and to make that work. And what the, the kind of the advantage that emerging markets have is less like huge need and not as much invested capital in, in the status quo, which means moving to these systems becomes easier. And that's where we can get the wonderful stories that we get out of like Togo and Brazil and places like that. So I don't actually feel as much burden to demonstrate the benefit. What I feel much more about is 
what's the way that you build this to ensure maximum extensibility in the future while protecting trust, safety, and prioritizing inclusion and accessibility? Well, and sadly, we don't have any real metrics. So it's not like any payment system is DPI. It's not like any ID system is DPI. You know, these it's, you know, it's really about, you know, these are systems that, as David says, they're maximizing inclusion. They are not maximizing shareholder value. <laughs> they are maximizing interoperability. They're maximizing the usage base on top of it and therefore healthy competition. So, you know, let's not kind of put lipstick on a pig here. This isn't every system is suddenly DPI. It's these fundamental characteristics that I think everyone's kind of speaking about. Maybe we haven't precisely gotten the words, but the more challenging part is to then really examine whether these characteristics are or aren't true. You know, I mean, I don't genuinely know, like, you know, is payment system in X geography really um, uh, designed with those uh, characteristics in mind or not. And, and I think that's a bit of the worry here. Yeah, may I, so, sorry, Noam, if I just- No, jump, no, please I jump in, Rob, and then I'm gonna bring Grace that, back in. Because completely agree with that. And I would just sort of uh, add that, you know, there's a question out there about whether we can or should work toward uh, either principles or standards around that, Priya. And um, one of the things we've been discussing as UNDP with uh, the tech envoy of the UN as well is, you know, what would a safeguards kind of set of principles look like um, that, that would kind of look at those sort of governance and, and uh, protective types of issues. Um, but on top of that, exactly to what David is saying, um, the other difference with the analog of this, or the, the analog of public infrastructure that was created, is we don't have the luxury of time uh, at the moment, given the pace of, of change in the technology space and the, and the pace of adoption that's happening here. Um, I mean, this, we're not on a curve of 50 or 100 years. Uh, we need to intervene, I think, to do this as a community, as a global community, to really define out these things and define what kind of makes good practice because if we don't, it's just going to run totally out of, out of control. I think you could maybe make that argument that that's sort of what's been happening so far. And I'm not talking about centralizing control. I'm just saying we as a community should look at what the norms around this might be. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just want to, I want to, I want to tee you up though, Grace. I know you've got thoughts already, but I want to add to that layer because you're somebody on the call who not in your current capacity, but in previous capacities has advised the President of the United States and, and Congress on related issues. And we don't live in a vacuum. We live in an era of, of geopolitical competition. And some of these questions of protection and what Rob was just talking about, there are real concerns about how it could be, some of the stuff could be misused by a surveillance state. And you know, how do those play in, especially given Anit's earlier reference, which I found interesting, about we have to almost uh, dispense with the idea that the way to approach this is by scaling up what works and really start by scaling at the population society level. The difference being that if you screw things up at the society level, the cost is much higher than if you learn from scaling up from something small. So Grace, over to you for your thoughts. That, that was a fantastic. Um, thank you for teeing that up, Noam, because um, I will do my requisite um, a trusted equipment uh, a plug, uh, which has to happen. I realize that I do sing for my supper. Um, and uh, but but I, I did want to go back to, I think, I mean, this conversation is fascinating, thinking about the organic growth of, you know, take a look at all the mobile payment systems that are really sort of proliferating across Africa right now. Um, and and uh, th these are organic, or um, there was a need, the um, the trustworthiness of these apps compared to the 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 respective federal systems that were in existence has really enabled, I think, and, and um, uh, and boosted, I think, citizen welfare generally. And it's it's been fascinating to watch. But again, we're talking about organic growth 
popping up everywhere in the same way that standards are produced, right? In the same way, so standards, um, and, and as Robert was was getting to is standards are, are typically sort of brought in in the way um, they, they grow, and this, this is a particular obsession of mine, but standards grow um, from the bottom up, right? In the United States and in most Western countries, at least up till now, um, we have not we have eschewed a, a top down approach to centralizing the way we're going to do things. So the idea is to build standards um, that are really truly reflective of um, an ecosystem that has agreed a stakeholder ecosystem that has agreed to a specific way or method of doing things, and allowing that approach to continue organically with the consensus of everyone who is going to be impacted by the particular standard. That is essentially the way we do it. We do it in a purpose driven uh, top down, uh, sorry, bottom up, industry led way. That, however, as we're talking about, um, uh, you know, and banks being quasi public infrastructure, do have, I think, still um, my payment systems still have a responsibility to nod at least to the centralized top down government approach, and to have that interaction work is going to be extraordinarily difficult. Um, I'll bring the geopolitical issue in now, Noam, um, particularly if you are working with um, countries that have, um, a, for example, a, a, a significant um, tendency towards companies that are less concerned about the ethics and the morality of using data you know, for, for, for surveillance, for um, uh, promoting uh, state purposes, for, um, uh, for citizen control, um, I think that's when you start to worry about um, how all of that disparate use of data gets cordoned up and, and tied to the way a, a government would be able to use this. Um, certainly, I think there's been a lot of attempts to figure out how to distinguish good equipment, good data, uh, good good technology from bad technology, to put it simply, I suppose. Um, and um, I think CSIS has been among them, uh, among the groups that has put out sort of a, a, a way of trying to distinguish um, uh, a, a number of factors that allows you to distinguish good, at least telecommunications equipment from bad. Um, so, you know, factors include, is the country headquartered in a, in a, a, com uh, in a country with rule of law? Does it have auditing practices, et cetera, et cetera? A number of different things. There's supposed to be a toolkit in a way to sort of ensure that the right equipment is being used and um, so that there aren't any backdoors or there aren't any um, ties that uh, that oblige or obligate the company to, to provide data back to a government that could be using it for hostile purposes. Uh, those are considerations that do have to come into account as we're thinking about DPI, especially as, you know, what, this is a weirdly di it's it's a weirdly dipolar tripolar world again because I really think it's east west but also south right it's east west south that are all trying to figure out how to exist with each other and um, as we go um, I'm sorry this is uh, I'm thinking as I'm talking which is always bad. <laughs> As we try to, to to sort through how we we you know we we draw the lines, and there are multiple lines that are going to be drawn for whatever sort of purposes, uh, um, uh, for whatever discussion we're having. Uh, I do think that the uh, the use of the private sector, the partnership of the private sector, will be um, uh, engaged in specific ways uh, in order to make I think the agendas of the respective uh, political forces uh, articulate. I think that was unnecessarily complicated, but I would love to hear reactions. No, that, that, that was very helpful, Grace, and I appreciate it. And, and a, a number of different issues raised there. Um, the question on, on the geopolitical uh, contention side of things uh, was a bit of an amalgamation of a few questions that we got from uh, live viewers uh, who are following this. Um, let me turn back and scan your faces for anyone who had a strong reaction uh, to any of the, the last few comments uh, to keep the conversation going for another minute before we close. David. Maybe, maybe just quickly on the geopolitical side. So I do think there's a geopolitical uh, lens to this. And I actually think um, there's a lot of kind of introspection that the United States should be doing around this. Cause I think there are two conflicting values the United States has that are coming into clash with one another. So on the one hand is the desire to support uh, democratic regimes and enable good governance. And on the other is a sense that actually um, 
the traditional model of thinking about the provision of many of these types of systems has been through large companies. And so not, not having a digital public infrastructure lens, but actually a private sector platform or a private sector service lens on this. And so the belief was, well, American companies will do well in the provisioning of these. And I think what you're seeing around the world is a lot of countries are saying, actually, we're really not comfortable having a foreign entity own the payment switch in our country, or we're really not happy to have a foreign entity have um, control over the code that um, that that does authentication of, of people's identity and, and citizenship or what have you in our country. And so I think those two things are in clash at the moment. And the United States has to kind of think a little bit about, um, does it care more about the kind of private versus public element of this, or does it care more about the kind of good governance um, element of this. And I think the concern I would have is if it drifts into the kind of private provision, I'm not sure a lot of people will see the distinction between an American approach and a Chinese approach, which I think are fundamentally different, but are both rooted in no trust our companies. Yeah, thanks for that. I see it prompted Grace with a, with a, a bit of a rejoinder here. Over to you, Grace. No, no, I, I do think that that's exactly right on, on the, um, the U.S. approach, because I that while they would love to leave it to the private sector to um, to, to to solve the issues, right, and in, in developing nations, they they come in also with a very heavy hand diplomatically, because I think the the China question is just too hard for them to ignore, and, and because quite frankly, the Chinese companies have been successful with uh, you know the Chinese backing. Um, yeah, absolutely. The um, thank you for the twinkles. Um, <laughs> the um, the. Uh, the, and particularly in developing uh, nations, uh, the, the Belt Road Initiative with the combined with the financing has been very, very successful. Uh, so the U.S. has already added. I think part of what you're seeing from the U.S. is, is the fact that it's reacting, right, as opposed to driving a, a particular agenda. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rob. It looks like you wanted to yeah. chime in. Yeah, I know there's gonna, not much time, but I, I just wanted to add just another angle to this, which is just looking right now in this whole, it's just stepping back and looking at digital public infrastructure. It is fascinating to see the leadership on this coming from the South. And so as a development issue, this is one thing where, and, and we've been through this in the last year, supporting India's presidency, where G20 delegates from many of the kind of developed countries that are there, uh, were not comfortable with this at first until we kind of got into the uh, real issues and, and what we're actually talking about here and the developmental benefits. So um, I just wanted to add that to kind of the, the discussion here that seeing this leadership from Southern countries that have, as David said, I think previously, you know, they have less legacy to deal with and they're jumping ahead on this and there's lessons to be learned there everywhere. Yeah, thank you for, for raising that. And I think it, it's also, some are leapfrogging and some are not. And in fact, the, the recent experience with the pandemic was a real litmus test. And I think drove for so many countries in the global South, that demand signal that you're, you're talking about. And I think that that is also important, uh, even from a geopolitical sense for the US government to pay attention to it as well. And that's why I think you're seeing even more uptake in fora like the G20. Uh, and I think we'll see more of it uh, even in the next week in the SDG summit. So we, I, we are at time, and I know that we could keep going. This was always intended to be a, a, an overview and a first in a series. Uh, we actually received uh, a, a question uh, from the live viewership that wasn't so much of a question, but was just observing that this conversation has really only scratched the surface and can we have all of you fabulous speakers back for another session? And that was from Adam Zabel from the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub. Um, we will have more in this series uh, of conversations. Uh, through CSIS and supported by the Gates Foundation. Uh, we're going to have sessions uh, where we dig in more. We're going to dig in more, I know, on the uh, the gender digital divide uh, and issues of gender equality and equity in, in low and middle income countries. Uh, we're going to talk more about the private sector engagements uh, and role of the private sector in all of this. Um, from lots of different angles. And we're gonna talk about the same uh, for multilateral organizations uh, and governments as well. And we're gonna dig more into some of the security questions. But for now, this was a wonderful discussion, very timely for so many reasons. And we at CSIS very much appreciate the opportunity to have hosted such a wonderful group of experts. So thank you to each of you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Noam. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye.